the uh, Kulin Nation on whose lands I have my home and I'm presenting you from uh, today. And I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So um, yeah, today I um, am gonna talk to you about some of our work in um, photonic chip technology. Um, I, I uh, discussed with Saeed about the technical level, so I've tried to put a, a little bit more technology in uh, than, than uh, sort of my usual sort of general access talk. So um, hopefully at the end, uh, there'll be some, some, some good questions. So um, before I get into the work of my, my own um, team, I wanted to um, introduce the um, uh, RMIT. I'm sure all of you are familiar that uh, RMIT is uh, in the um, uh, CBD. I'm in, I'm in the CBD campus, not in the Bandura campus. Um, but um, it seems like some months ago that uh, I used to be in my office um, up here. Um, uh, but um, just for context, um, many of you may not know that uh, RMIT actually has a pretty substantial microfabrication facility also in the uh, CBD campus, just walking distance um, from, from my office. And so I, this facility is the um, micro nano research facility. And it's been established for, for, for maybe five years as the micro nano research facility, but its history date back dates back to 1983 when it was the Microelectronic Materials and Technology Center. Um, and it represents about 2000 square meters of cleanroom space. So this is quite substantial. Um, and it's got about, uh, 60 major tools uh, and major tools we define as tools that are probably over about $300,000. Um, and then about 250 minor tools um, uh, and all of those you can book um, uh, and have access to. There are, there are maybe 400, 450 to 500 users um, of, of this facility. Um, and the major focal points are advanced materials, uh, particularly 2D materials, um, nanoelectronics and sensors. Um, and so there's a really good example of um, uh, one of the sensors that we're very proud of here, which is the uh, ingestible gas capsule which is currently being commercialized by uh, Atmo Biosciences. Um, integrated photonics, which I'm gonna tell you a lot about uh, now, and biomedical devices. And some of my work fringes onto biomedical devices, um, but there is a great deal of work um, also going on with uh, wearable uh, patches and um, indeed now with the um, uh, coronavirus um, uh, technologies for uh, drug delivery. Um, the philosophy of the facility is that it's, it's here to support our researchers. Um, so I direct the facility, I also do research, but really the facility's um, here to enable uh, research and particularly enable collaboration. So if you're interested in, in coming in and using the facility with us, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but we also want to sort of take it perhaps a step further than fundamental research. We really want to be doing rapid technology development. So there's a lot of emphasis being put on um, uh, uh, sort of direct write patterning tools. So for example, here you can see there's a 3D printer which prints at the nanoscale, the nanoscribe, um, but we have a lot of other direct write tools that can basically make prototypes in seconds to minutes. Um, so the, the point here being that we can make pretty complex chips um, overnight or, or in a day or two. Um, and that means that we can do very rapid, rapid technology development in collaboration, do design, fabricate, test, and then iterate on that. Um, and our particular emphasis is on um, end user translation. So we're always looking for people who might benefit from some of these technologies, um, find out what their needs are, and then adapt what we're doing to sort of match those. So the micro nano research facility, essentially it makes materials and chips, um, uh, but those chips, uh, um, not really all that useful themselves. I, I sort of joke with some people when I give tours that um, uh, 100 microns, which is about the width of a human hair, is actually uncomfortably large for, for most of us. So this is, this is getting really, really big and most of our tools really aren't designed to deal with things that big. Um, and so uh, we, uh, our, our sister facility, the Advanced Manufacturing Precinct, which is all about 3D printers um, and has um, uh, tools that you can walk inside and print engine heads and turbine blades and things like that. Um, for them, 100 microns is you know, almost inconceivably small and certainly 
um, some of the things where we can print things less than 10 nanometers is just is just off the planet. So um, there's this gap between or where we you know we connect we connected to about 100 microns. There are tools at the AMP that that can get down to 100 microns, and there are tools at the micro nano research facility that can get up to 100 microns. But but really, it's almost uncomfortable for both of us. One's uncomfortably small, one's uncomfortably big. So we invested in a facility that's particularly um, designed to operate comfortably at 100 microns. So it can go up to a few millimeters and down to maybe 10 microns, but it's most comfortable at 100 microns. And it's designed for working with ceramic materials. And uh, it, it also works with metals and polymers, but, but particularly it works with ceramic materials. And so you can see down the bottom here, this isn't something we made, this is something I pinched from the Kyocera website. Um, but you can see that this is the technology that people often use for making the packages that you put chips into. And so if you have a circuit board and you see there's an integrated circuit on that circuit board, that's probably a ceramic package that you're looking at. Inside is the integrated circuit, but the ceramic package is there so you can pick it up and it'll survive being stuck down on the circuit board. So, so uh, this is the only um, uh, low temperature co-fired ceramic research facility in Australia. And uh, the philosophy behind this really is about trying to make um, de uh, package devices to so take our micro and nanotechnologies and make them somewhat macro scale so that you can actually plug them in and use them in the system. And, and we're working with the advanced manufacturing precinct, which does mostly 3D printing, to also start interfacing with some of these ceramic technologies so that we can potentially put those ceramic package devices into 3D printed structures as well, and then rapidly prototype large systems. So, if you're interested in that, um, I'd love to. I'd love to talk to you to you more. So that's. I'm, I'm now taking my director of the micro nano research facility hat off, and I'm going to put on my director of my own research team, the Integrated Photonics and Applications Center. Now. Um, the title of this talk is um, precision medicine, um, uh, something to do with precision medicine, making the internet faster and also uh, positioning satellites. So I'll try and say something a little bit about each of those, um, but I can't say a lot about any of them because I don't really have enough time. So um, I, I encourage you to ask me questions, but hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a flavor and some idea of how my, my, my team works and the sort of thing we do. So uh, my own team, it's the Integrated Photonics and Applications Centre, and it has nearly 20 years of uh, experience in integrated photonics, and 20 years probably takes me back to the uh, very end of my PhD. And one of the projects that we worked on there was with um, uh, DSTO, as they were called then, uh, and also uh, Micrio, uh, which have uh, just, just become uh, Micrio L3 Harris. Um, trying to make high speed uh, lithium niobate modulators. So this is a chip that we actually made here. Um, and um, we're trying to make those, make those modulators so that um, this package could go, for example, out on the wingtip of an aircraft, pick up radar signals, and then deliver those radar signals with as little attenuation and noise as possible into a central processing unit in the aircraft that could then decide what to do. And so, for example, there might be a, a, a missile or some radar threat coming and the um, self-protection system might see that and then decide to deploy um, flares or chaff or something to confuse the, the, the threat. So this was, this was the point of this um, uh, chip. And so we actually went a lot further than a typical university would do um, uh, even 20 years ago where we not only, I, I personally designed this chip, um, uh, but we uh, fabricated it and actually came up with, you know, ISO 9001 uh, validated processes for manufacturing it, made several hundred of them and packaged them and then had them all validated to military specifications as well and actually flight trialed at the end of it. So, so this was a bit of a trial by fire uh, into uh, technology translation and um, I think I, I survived and learnt a lot, um, so that's 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 good. Um, but um, after doing that, we thought, oh yes, you know, around about this time, let's um, launch this as a uh, um, some sort of startup because you know the, the tech boom was all happening. But of course, by by two thousand two thousand and one, that all deflated, and um, so we went back to the labs um, and did a lot of uh, fundamental research. And so this is an example of uh, I think one of the first. Um, 
microwave photonic uh, signal processing systems on a chip. This has become a very interesting area where, as photonic chip technology has become more sophisticated. This is a very simple chip, um, but it's regarded uh, quite, quite well as one of the first papers uh, in, in this field. We also did a lot of work with the same platform doing nonlinear physics. So we collaborated with um, Yuri Kipsha and Dragomir Neshev uh, in exploring how uh, high power optical pulses uh, would, would interact in this. And this is actually a photograph, not a model. So it's a quite a cute uh, uh, multicolored photograph uh, of one of our chips. And we also started looking at silicon photonics. So we got lithium niobate here and, and silicon photonics. I'll explain what those are um, towards the end of my talk. Um, we then joined the ARC Centre of Excellence Kudos, um, which finished in 2017. So that's, um, that's now historical. Um, but uh, my role in that centre was to try and coordinate microfabrication of photonic chips across Australia. And that included uh, Sydney University uh, and ANU particularly. And so part of the, you know, our, our ability to make these photonic chips is really down to a legacy uh, from being part of that ARC centre. So we thank the ARC for the investment there and we kind of take the responsibility of taking that forward and saying, okay, we've had a lot of support. We really need to show that uh, this photonic chip technology can be useful to the Australian community. Um, we've done a lot of work on novel silicon photonics and partnered with some of the world leaders. So there's um, the University of Ghent. Uh, you may have heard of uh, IMEC in Belgium. This is one of the largest um, uh, integrated uh, electronic uh, faci uh, research facilities in the world. Um, they have basically been tasked with uh, sort of upgrading that with photonics. And so we've got sort of a pretty strong partnership with them. We, I'll talk a little bit more about this. We've actually sort of launched a prototyping service and a design service and have a pretty rigorous framework for doing that. So if you want photonic chips, we've actually got uh, very, very sophisticated tools and, and processes for doing that. Um, and we've looked at a lot of um, sort of applications of that in, in biomedical, and I'll particularly talk about that um, next, next in my talk. So now that KUDOS is over, um, the group that I lead is the Integrated Photonics and Applications Centre. And I'll, I'll just explain a little bit what this is. It, it works in a number of different areas. Um, so data communications, this is really what's driving integrated photonics at the moment. And it's, it's particularly for data centers. And so here you can see a picture of a data center. And the key here is that all of these computers, each of these racks, every one of those green lights that you see there is a pretty high performance computer. And all of those computers have got to be able to talk to each other as fast as possible. And so what you can see here is a cable and that cable actually has an optical fiber in it to enable the, the computer to talk to the computer below it um, at, at, as, fast, as fast as it can. And so given that there are thousands, tens of thousands of these computers in every data center, there needs to be tens of thousands of these cables, uh, maybe even more. Um, and in, in each of these cables, there's an optical fiber, but somehow you've got to turn the electronics into, into light and then turn the light back into electronics at the other end. And so this um, application, this cable's really got to be hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. So, so that's really what's driving um, uh, uh, data center, driving integrated photonic technology. Um, and, um, but Australia's role in that is, is not very high. Um, really, this is all happening in Silicon Valley. There's, um, as this technology is developing, there's an Im Im increasing amount of work being done in defense and metrology. I'll talk a little bit about this. I mentioned radar warning receivers before, but there's spectroscopy and other types of sensors as well. Um, this is a little bit niche, but it's very important for Australia. If we're going to have these sorts of sensors and technology on our defense platforms, we've got to be able to sort of maintain them and support them uh, at home. Um, uh, so there's a lot of emphasis on trying to build our capability in this space. Um, but personally, I think the, the genuine um, uh, industrial opportunity that's untapped here is, is biomedical diagnostics. So um, Melbourne has an extraordinary density of biomedical uh, technology uh, research um, and a pretty good um, cross-section of industry but um, I, I think that that really has not yet um, sort of picked up in a way that it should have. So I personally, this is where I'm putting my, uh, my uh, uh, bet uh, on for the future, but I think we need to go via this route and also pay special attention here because this is, this is really important for Australia.
So um, the center strategy is to try and be pulled along by these applications. So I'll talk first about the applications, then I'll talk about this technology pipeline very briefly that gets us to enable those applications. So the application areas are diverse, they're data communications, biomedical, uh, and uh, defense, sensing for defense. So first off, I'll talk about the biomedical. So I, I was promised a precision medicine and biomedicine. Um, so this, this uh, effort is actually led by uh, Cesar, Cesar Huefes, um, and he's an expert in biochemistry. Um, so, uh, and, but he, he has a history and a background in using his biochemistry with photonic chips um, for doing um, precision biosensing. So the way that biosensing works, and I've just um, pinched a illustration here from uh, this review article uh, by Laura Lechuga, who was Caesar's uh, PhD supervisor, um, that, that basically if you have um, light trapped in an optical waveguide, so uh, that's what our chips do. They have um, these uh, films on the surface and the films trap the light um, via total internal reflection. And so what you can see here is the distribution of light. The light's mostly inside the film, a little bit outside the film. If I put some biomolecules on the surface here, um, as those biomolecules, and these are antibodies, these are illustrated as antibodies, but they could be DNA probes or other, other types of um, uh, selective molecules, they should only respond to the particular analyte. And so these, these yellow triangles up here are meant to represent the thing I'm wanting to sense. So um, these molecules will only grab the particular thing we're interested in. And when they do grab them, it actually creates more dielectric mass on the surface. And so the light travels more slowly when there's more stuff on the surface. And so what I'm trying to measure here is a very tiny change in phase of the light, the light traveling just that little bit slower because there's some extra proteins or something sitting on the surface here that have been trapped by these molecules. So the way to measure that is with a interferometer. And so this is a very, very simple interferometer called a Max Zender interferometer. Basically the light comes in on this um, waveguide here. So the light's trapped in, the, in that little line here it gets split in half. So this is like a wire for light. It gets split in half. So half the light goes this way, half the light goes this way. This half of the light is protected and continues to the output here. This half of the light is exposed to the medium we're trying to sense um, and then proceeds to the output here where it is interfered with. So basically it meets the light that was protected here, the reference arm. And if they've got the same phase, like if they've traveled the same speed, they'll be in phase and then they'll constructively interfere and you'll get a bright light coming out here. But if there's been a phase shift here and they're now out of phase, they can destructively interfere and you'll end up with dark. And so you can see here, this is the optical intensity as a function of wavelength of this, um, this structure. And what, you, what you're looking for is as the analytes, as the things you're trying to sense actually accumulate on this arm, the response will shift and the amount of shift that you get here is actually um, relatable to the number of molecules that have arrived at the surface. And so if you can do this in a very, very sensitive way, potentially you can even measure individual molecules, individual proteins arriving at, at the surface. And, and the sensitivity of these sorts of chips is getting pretty close to the level that you would need for single molecule detection. So that's, that's an illustration. Um, this is actually a chip that we made um, at RMIT, and I'll get you to focus on the bottom half of this uh, picture first. So what you can see here is this is this is an integrated circuit. These are all the inputs. These are all, all the outputs. And these little lines here are wires that guide light. Uh, and this is on silicon. And so the, the light is trapped in those, in those uh, little light guides uh, and comes down. And for example, here, will will, will um, uh, get taken to this device. Now this device is a max ender, it's an interferometer. And so I've got, a, or, or maybe, maybe we'll take this one. Um, I'm zooming in here. And what you can see is that the light comes in here, it's split in half. This is the reference arm. So the, the light goes across here and comes to the output. And then this is the sensing arm. And you can see the sensing arm is coiled up into a pretty tight coil. This is hundred microns. And remember that's the width of a hair. So this is a pretty small um, spot. This is also about the size, if you use a commercial, 
you can get commercial printers for biomolecules. If you, like a, like a bubble jet printer, if you print a spot, the smallest pixel that you can print is about 100 microns. So basically a spot from that printer will print um, biomolecules on the surface here. So that's why that's about 100 microns. But you can see that the light will go round and round and round this spiral until it gets to the middle and then it'll turn round and come back out again. And so there's a lot of um, uh, interaction between the light and the fluid on top here. And then it comes back out and meets the reference arm and then proceeds to the output. And so if there's um, a lot of material accumulating on the surface here, then this will slow the light in this arm down and it will change how the light interferes at this point and we can use that as a sensor. Now, if you look at the picture here, actually this chip is, is this um, rectangle under here and these are the optical fibers that we're using to interrogate it. But there's all this um, sort of what looks like glass um, circuitry sitting on top. So I'll explain what that is now. So typically, and this is just an example of a uh, photonic chip measurement setup um, that is in uh, Laura Lechuga's lab. So I mentioned Laura Lechuga before um, was um, uh, Caesar's uh, PhD supervisor in Barcelona. Um, so this is where one of her chips would go. And you can see there's all these um, uh, wires and uh, free space optics and um, some tubes going here. And there's a uh, sort of a, ex a mechanical exchange of this rotates around and decides which, which of these tubes is actually attached to this, um, this pump here, which is a syringe on a uh, screw that basically um, is being withdrawn, pulling fluid uh, through. So this is, this is a sort of a typical laboratory. This is fairly automated, um, but it's, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit unwieldy. And certainly if you wanted to actually have this as a point of care device, um, this, is, this is a bit complicated. So uh, my PhD student, uh, Crispin, um, actually pioneered um, trying to integrate all of this together. So this is um, an example of what he was working on. So you can see over here, there's a video running which is actually a zoomed in version of that um, microfluidic plumbing I showed you before. Now this is maybe 300 microns across, so it's relatively, you know, so maybe three hairs wide. Um, so you can see this uh, with a camera, but it's, um, it, it's still pretty small. And what you're seeing here is there's a pump that's pumping um, the fluid through, and then there's all these valves that are deciding, and there's some more valves here, that are deciding which of these colored reservoirs the um, fluid is interacting with. And, and that seems to have stopped. Um, so, so basically what you can do is you can choose any one of those six um, reservoirs and then pump them to either the, the reference arm or the sensing arm. So for example, we can use this for cleaning the sensor and then introducing the analyte and then refreshing it and, and uh, do all of that automatically. And so this was actually, um, uh, here's some, some more schematics of it. This was actually interface to Laura Lechuga's chips and the idea was to um, have this uh, sitting on a buoy in the ocean, uh, taking samples of seawater every day and measuring to see how much antibiotics is in the seawater. And so even trace amounts of antibiotics that have washed down from farms uh, into the rivers, out into the ocean, uh, this chip is sensitive enough to be able to detect that. Um, we've done a number of other uh, research with this sort of technology. So for example, um, here, we got under the cover of a uh, small in 2018. Um, and what we were able to do was actually measure the secretions from a single cell. So we were able to trap a single cell and actually measure the proteins that that one cell was um, uh, uh, expressing and see how far they got from the cell and the influence. Um, we're now working with, um, this is with um, Hatice uh, Al Altug in um, EPFL in Switzerland. Um, at the moment, we're looking at what happens if you have two of these cells and you trap them and how do they talk to each other because cells need to be uh, with other cells in order to survive well. Um, we've also done a lot of work with uh, Warwick Nisbet um, at the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases, um, looking at the impact of um, uh, mechanical stress on blood clotting. Um, and um, this, is a, this is a fairly old paper that we got published in, uh, in Nature Medicine, but we're still working on that today uh, with trying to introduce drugs and, and have um, lots of different shapes and also have fairly high throughput with lots of parallel systems um, on a chip. So that's that, that work is ongoing. 
So that's all I'm going to say about um, uh, biosensing. I'm now going to switch gears to accelerating the internet. So the the um, that was biomedical. Now talking about data communications. Um, and this is headed up by uh, Dr. Bill Corcoran, but Bill is actually at Monash University. So he's an expert in uh, data communications and our role is to try and support him with uh, photonic chip technology. So um, you probably know this already, but um, uh, the MBN, um, not far from our houses, the MBN is optical fiber, certainly all data um, that's transmitted between cities uh, and even across cities is, is, is on optical fiber. And, you know, typically digital information is um, as zeros and ones. So the illustration here is showing you um, bright pulses traveling down fibers. And so we should interpret perhaps those bright pulses as ones and the spaces between them as zeros maybe. Um, but there are lots of tricks you can play to try and increase the capacity of optical fibers. and. Um, one of them is using wavelength multiplexing. And so here you can see this is, um, people who are uh, familiar with the band Pink Floyd uh, would recognize this, um, that basically if you have a prism, you can split up white light um, traveling in a single beam into multiple colors. And so if you think about each of those colors as a communications channel, um, this is a little bit like the same way that radio works. So you have different frequencies uh, in radio, you can have different wavelengths in light. Um, then you can modulate information onto each of those different wavelengths and um, put them all together and send them all down one optical fiber and then separate them at the other end. And so the, the analogy here is by adding extra lanes to a, a freeway. But, um, and you can probably have about 80 of these different wavelengths um, uh, in the sort of modern optical fiber communications um, uh, systems. If you're interested in discussing why, where the limitations and opportunities are there, I'd be happy to do that after the talk. Um, but there are other tricks you can play. So um, if I've multiplied my capacity by um, 80, by having 80 different wavelengths, is that as far as I can go? Well, I can, I can improve things by perhaps thinking about a bigger alphabet. So at the moment, my alphabet is just zero and one. And so that's illustrated here. You can see this level is zero, this level is one. And what this is, this is called an eye diagram. And um, basically what I want to know is that I can tell the difference between a zero and a one. And, and so you can see the transition from zero to one and one to zero and staying at one. Um, these are all the possible transition possibilities. And as long as there's a gap here, then I know that I can tell the difference between a zero and a one. But there's a lot of space here. And so maybe I can use that space. And so here's a sort of more sophisticated example. Um, here, instead of just using two levels of zero and one, I'm actually using four levels. So this is, this is um, zero, this is one, you know, this is maybe a third and this is maybe a sixth. So you can still see that there's sort of open eyes in between. So I can tell the difference between all of them and provided that the uh, noise is low enough, then I, I will, you know, if the noise gets, gets high, then it'll be harder and harder to tell the difference between these. But if the noise is pretty low, I can potentially even add more channels in. So for example, here is one with eight channels. So you can see eight different levels and you can just see the difference between here. These are beginning to crash into each other, but still that's sufficient to do, um, uh, you know, eight level modulation. And this is just intensity. I can also change the phase. So I can also um, basically sort of frequency modulate the light and, and actually have multiple different levels of phase and amplitude. And if I multiply those together, this is a eight by eight array. So I can have um, 64 different letters in my alphabet. So this is a good way of increasing the um, data capacity. So the question then is, okay, if I, the limitation here is the laser needs to be a good quality. The laser needs to um, have a, very low noise in intensity, so I can have lots of levels vertically and very low, low noise in uh, phase so that I can have lots of levels here in phase. And I need to have 80 of them if I wanna have as much um, capacity as I can sitting down a fiber. So how am I gonna have 80 really high quality lasers um, in, a, in an affordable package so that I can, I can use this um, for communications in, in, in um, 
uh, you know, potentially even in my home. So this is um, where uh, photonic chip technology can help. So um, I've drawn here a ring and a waveguide coupled to that ring. And so if you imagine that there's light, laser light coming along trapped in this waveguide and a tiny amount of that laser light is coupled across into the ring. And then it goes all the way around and very, very little of that power is lost. Um, and then it meets the, the laser light coming um, through here. And if, it, if they're in phase, then more light will couple across into the ring. And, and then it'll come round. And then if it's in phase again, twice as much light will couple into the ring. And then if it's in phase again, twice of, twice of that will couple into the ring and so on and so forth. Now, the power can build up quite significantly. So you'll end up with a lot more power on the ring than you actually have coming in because it's being stored in the ring and, and added to every time it goes around the ring. So the question then is, and this is, this, you can think about this a little bit like um, rubbing your finger around um, the surface of a wine glass um, that you can hear a noise and that's the wine glass vibrating. And if you sort of stay in phase, you can actually sort of build up a louder and louder and louder sound. So the more times you can go around this ring, the more power you can build up. And so in these rings, in, in using the modern technology, you can actually potentially have these rings that are so low loss that the light can go around up to 10 million times. And so you can have, you know, hundreds of thousands of maybe even millions of times the power in the ring than the power you're actually introducing here. So what that will do is it'll create a lot of unusual effects that you don't experience normally um, with, with uh, materials because there's extraordinary amount of um, uh, optical interaction and you can sort of push materials into their nonlinear regime. And if you design things carefully, um, basically it'll actually start making like the, the optical equivalent of a sound and that will actually uh, spread out into a chord which, which um, uh, will resonate a, a, as a comb. And this is what's called a uh, optical frequency comb. And this is a very hot topic at the moment. So this is a science paper published by Pip Kippenberg um, and he's um, uh, a well-regarded uh, world expert in this and showing a whole bunch of different applications, including um, you know, atomic clocks and photonic radar, distance measurement, um, and, but particularly coherent communications. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a really hot topic. Um, and um, we, we have the photonic chip technology to be able to uh, do this sort of thing. So this is a photonic chip that we used. And so um, the, this, this, is, this, is, this is a photonic chip. That's a $2 coin for reference, uh, Australian coin. Um, this is a photonic chip. And right in the corner here, you can see this ring. So if you zoom in, there, there's the ring and this is a millimeter. So the chips the size of your fingernail, the ring that's actually doing all the work is, is much, much smaller. Um, and what we were able to do with that is by putting laser light into it, we were able to create those 80 comb lines um, and they were sufficient quality, low enough noise and, lo and low enough phase noise, uh, low enough intensity noise and phase noise that we could actually transmit a record breaking amount of data on them. So um, uh, we worked with Bill Corcoran at um, uh, Monash University and also Dave Moss at Swinburne University. Um, and we have RMIT actually led a consortium to build a laboratory that covers most of Melbourne and actually goes from RMIT. There's a fiber loop that goes from RMIT all the way out to Monash and all the way back again. And this is actually made out of fibers that were installed um, 20 years ago. So this is representative of the sort of fiber that's stringing the city um, anyway. Um, so we were able to demonstrate the capability of these chips to actually do really high speed communications in fairly ordinary fiber and um, show the promise of this fiber for, for upgrading. And we were able to um, actually achieve the world's fastest uh, internet speed of 44 terabits per second um, um, from a single chip. So that, that, that qualification is important. And this was taken up by actually more than a thousand different news outlets um, a couple of months ago. And um, we were particularly uh, uh, pleased with this uh, print media what one, which is a nice photograph of Bill, Dave Moss and, and myself in the lab at RMIT. So uh, in the few minutes I've got left, 
Um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the work we're doing on sensing and metrology. Um, and uh, th there's you know, a lot of applications in civ civilian, but this is of particular relevance for, for defence, uh, we think. And the person who leads this group is uh, Dr. Andy Bowers. Um, so uh, recently, um, actually um, two months ago, um, we were awarded a uh, Cooperative Research Centre project um, uh, in partnership with uh, Australian National University ANU, um, Advanced Navigation and uh, Corridor Insights to build, uh, use our photonic chip technology to build um, gyroscopes. And um, I'll explain in a moment what this is. So this is, we, we're pretty pleased with this um, because this is um, really sort of realizing our, our vision of sort of being more in, end user uh, engaged uh, and actually sort of having a sufficient money to really take our technology out of the laboratory and really sort of uh, potentially make um, Australian products out of it. So this is sort of the application um, this is a, a drone that is being used by the company um, Corridor Insights. And what they're doing is they're using this drone to sort of fly around um, objects and map it. So the drone has a, a LiDAR system. This is a, like a light radar. So basically what the LiDAR system is, it sort of measures the distance um, with a laser from, from where the drone is to uh, an object that's going to reflect the light. Um, and so what you can see here is there's sort of a point cloud. This, these are all just individual points. Um, and um, in order to put those points into a, a, a meaningful map, the drone needs to know where it is and, and how it's sort of um, oriented. So there's actually a gyroscope here that, that um, helps the drone know um, ha, where, where it is and, and how it's moving uh, in, in real time so that it can actually sort of register each of these dots in the correct location. So some of the applications for this are, for example, uh, flying along uh, railway lines and actually measuring um, movements in, in a buckling of the railway tracks or um, proximity of branches of trees and things in, into the railway line um, and, and doing this all automatically. Um, but the gyroscopes, the quality of the gyroscopes that are required for those sorts of applications are, are pretty high. Um, and the cost is at the moment um, tens of thousands of dollars. So really what we're looking at is ways of trying to make this cheaper and lighter so that it can be sort of more deployed. So this is what a gyroscope looks like. So you've, you've got a fiber coil, um, you've got a, a modulator, a Y splitter. This is a very simple one uh, and a laser and a detector. So your laser comes in here, split, goes around the fiber coil. If the coil moves, then the light going one way around the coil we'll see a different phase than the light going around the other, uh, other way around the coil. And what you're trying to do is detect that. It's very, very similar to the photonic biosensor I mentioned at, at the start. This is a, a um, Sanyak interferometer. The biosensor is a Max Zender interferometer, but for us, the, the technology is very similar. And so what we thought was that you could, should be able to just integrate this um, similarly in, into a photonic chip, and that would make them more manufacturable, more robust, potentially even more accurate because you can be more precise. You don't, you don't have to worry about, you know, how you've glued the fibers on. It's, this is all uh, made using uh, semiconductor processing. So that's, that's our vision. Um, and this is something that we're working on at the moment. And the platform that we're looking at using is a platform called lithium niobate technology. And I won't go through the details, um, but again, if you want to ask me questions, I'm, I'm happy to share them. But um, what's important is the uh, lithium niobate material is very, very good at measuring phase uh, and, and converting between um, electrical impulses and optical phase. Um, and we, can, we, we have all the tools at um, uh, RMIT in the Micro Nano Research Facility to take uh, complete wafers of lithium niobate and actually make um, fully functional integrated circuits that are packaged uh, as well. So just very quickly, uh, Guang Hui is in charge of doing a lot of that fabrication. So he fits he, here in the pipeline. So we've got all these applications pulling on, on our technology. Uh, Guang Hui is in charge of uh, making sure that the chips can actually be fabricated. And we actually launched this um, Australian silicon photonics um, capability. Uh, and the idea is that we can, if, if we are given, we have um, what's called a, a process design kit um, for our fab fabrication. And this is actually built into 
uh, commercially licensed uh, design frameworks so that we can um, you can actually design using one of these design frameworks and provided it uh, uh, obeys the rules of that design framework, we can fabricate it on our process and you will get back what you, what you simulated. Um, and so that's very important for people to have confidence. Um, but we can do that very, very quickly. So we, we can actually take a design and return chips in about six weeks. And um, our friends at IMEC in Belgium are so impressed by that that they actually send us chips to um, prototype for them, so they, you know, send us the designs and we post them chips back to back to back to Belgium. Um, we've also used this for for a lot of research and um, uh, are in the in the process of scaling that up for this is silicon. We're in the process of scaling that up for lithium niobate. Um, so these these are just some examples of you know designs to you know fabricated circuits, um, for example. Um, and then last but not least uh, is uh, Tuck Nguyen. And Tuck Nguyen is our theory simulation and design expert. Um, and he's really good at sort of nonlinear optics, um, but also in terms of the sort of um, uh, curating the uh, software front end and the, the actual um, processes for how, how, we, how we do this design. And uh, some of the software that uh, Tuck primarily wrote has actually been licensed into this uh, framework. So you can actually use um, our technology in, in this um, uh, technology framework that's, that's used by many, many uh, industries around the world to make their photonic chips. So um, we can design, fabricate and test prototypes right here in Melbourne. And this is uh, Andy Bowes uh, um, posing for a photograph with a wafer full of photonic chips in the Micro Nano Research Facility. Um, but I believe we can actually manufacture in Australia. And so I'm, I'm sort of exploring the opportunities with, um, uh, you know, some of our end users like uh, Advanced Navigation and uh, Corridor Insights about whether it makes sense to be able to do relatively small volumes. We're never going to be making hundreds of millions of chips in Australia, but, but I think we could, we could actually make a reasonable business case for making thousands of them but doing them in a, in a sort of high value add where the values in the, the sort of design and how we use them and, and the, the opportunities that they unlock rather than the, the, the sort of mass manufacturer of the chips themselves. So we've got great ideas, we've got the infrastructure um, and, and know-how and we've got growing interest from Australian internet, uh, industries. You may have seen recently that um, I was promoting a survey we did of Australian, Australian New Zealand industries um, uh, that are using photonics and there, there are nearly a thousand of them and they represent, um, uh, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry for, for Australia. Um, so I think um, we can sort of feed them with photonic chips. Um, if you're enthusiastic, I'd be happy to talk. Uh, this is my email, uh, website's here and you can also follow me on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you very much for that superb lecture, Anna. Really appreciate that. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, for our participant, uh, if anyone has any question, uh, please raise your virtual hand and then I can unmute you. In the meantime, I would like to uh, ask the first question. Um, and you started uh, with uh, talking about fundamental research and applied research. Uh, in your opinion, what are the greatest barriers and challenges when researchers, they are trying to do uh, applied and translational type research? So, so um, you know, they, they, they don't call it the valley of death for nothing. Um, so, so, you know, th those of you who've sort of studied this, the, there's this um, uh, valley of death between uh, technology uptake by industry. Like if, if, if your technology is actually useful to industry, they will put their hand in their pocket and pay for it, you know? Um, so, so that, that's great. Um, but getting to that point, uh, it, it, it's not kind of reasonable to expect the company to sort of take a bet on you uh, hoping, and uh, they, they don't have the time. They're, they're too busy, you know, running their businesses um, that they, that what, what you're working on needs to be of value to them in about two years you know, some of them can sort of stretch their horizon out to maybe three or four years, but but not much further than that. Um, in truth, the the uh, a quick um, idea to commercial product is ten years. Um, that you know the, the you know technology readiness levels um, generally it's you know there's ten of them and each one's about a year. Um, if you if you're quick, uh, often it can be longer than that. 
Um, so, um, and if you think about discovery projects, well, they're three years. So, so you know, there's three years from, you know, uh, 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 and you're assessed on how, you know, outrageously innovative those uh, ideas are. So you've got the first three years covered by, you know, the ARC and, and um, you know, fundamental research covering. You've probably got, you know, the last, you know, four, at a, you know, years, you know, sort of covered by industry. The CRC program is a pretty good example of trying to fill that gap, but it comes from the industry end. So, you know, it encourages the industry to sort of take a couple of extra steps back. So they'll probably go to um, tech, you know, sort of um, maybe technology readiness level four, um, but that's still a little beyond what you would get with a discovery project. Um, so you've really got to be thinking about a 10 year pipeline uh, you've got to want to do it. Um, um, all the signposts, like with the ARC, all the signposts, I, I, I still get uh, when I put up grants for linkage projects, for example, which are meant to be industry um, led, um, I still get feedback saying this is not innovative enough. This is the, you know, this is, this is just technology development. Um, and it's like, well, what do you want? You know, the, the, you know, if I, if I, if everything's a discovery project, we're just going to be sort of playing around at, you know, um, at the discovery end of the spectrum forever. Uh, and this is, I think, Australia's big challenge is that, you know, Australia, the Australian community really needs to get behind and get enthusiastic about people pushing up into the technology translation and understand there's a lot of really stupid stuff that that gets in the way of of of, of those sorts of things working uh, working or not working but i think it's improving i think there's a lot more emphasis now on entrepreneurship uh and there's a lot of more mechanisms like uh, innovations connections and uh, the crc program that are there to sort of help fantastic thank you uh over to you professor mike you're uh, on mute yeah hi i'm on mute okay um, thanks for the uh, very interesting lecture. I'm not an engineer, I'm a mathematician and data scientist. Um, and basically, my question could be completely stupid. Uh, at least not one really good thing question. that came from COVID-19 is that we, uh, I am actually able to listen to you uh, and discover that this is uh, happening around us. Uh, we work a lot with... Um, um, uh, basically interpretation of uh, signals and uh, images that come from the human body, like uh, we work on uh, sensor analytics for physiology, medicine and health. Mm -hmm. And what you mentioned about biosensing is something that is very interesting for us because we take, we, my research group and my center, but the group in particular is an expert in time series analysis. Uh, also, uh, we are data analysts, but I'm applied mathematician, so we also make models of uh, what comes, what we can find out from the signal, uh, including delay differential equations, di differential equations uh, using dynamical systems. In your language, it would be control theory. Uh, but we, for example, look at, um, especially now for COVID-19, uh, we are looking for met ways and methods to assess patients who have the disease remotely or looking at, uh, at we, because we don't know, but we're looking at uh, the mobile phones as option. Uh, and we have the technology or we develop the technology to make what we can capture with mobile phones. Like for example, we have the technology to, from a picture, not a picture, video of person to assess the heart rate. Uh, but maybe you have the technology to do even better with this biosensing uh, because it, it is both like the sensor and the, the light. Uh, so it is something very interesting that could be explored. So. Yeah, so, so my experience of biomedical research is that um, it really needs to be pulled along by a clinician. Um, so, uh, and, you know, all, all the biomedical research that we do, there's, there's a hospital at the, at, the, um, at the sort of end of it, and always we need to go to them and say, what do you think is needed here? Um, because uh, we, we've tried, we've tried to go, oh, look, I, th I, think, th I, th I think this would be useful for you, but it's, it's really hard to push that in, you know they don't want to you know it's a bit like businesses they don't have time to to deal with it so so I mean if you if you've got 
connections to clinicians and you need our technology, send me an email. I'd love to talk to you, um, and uh, we can we can certainly look into it. But you know, I I understand my role is uh, technology platform support. Um, there's lots of amazing things we can do, but you tell me what the problem is. We'll 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 try and help you fix it. Everyone appears to be muted. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, yes, I'm unmuted now. Yeah, no. uh, it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will probably contact you, but I'll speak to the clinicians we work with, uh, yep. Monash Health and Western Health. They may not even know what they know, what they need, but if we manage to explain to them what is the advantage, because they want as little uh, in, invasive and as. Uh, as little because these are ICUs we are talking yep. about. So it has to be something that is manageable, doesn't obstruct nurses, etc. So we'll I'll contact them and then I'll contact you uh, because yep, this yep, could yep, be yep, really very nice. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, over to you, Abbas. Oh, thank you so much, Said. Uh, Professor Arnon, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Indeed, quite eye-opening for myself. I have a question about the design. I believe that the design of this equipment and tools at the moment is done based on some criteria and objectives. I wonder whether this design is a kind of manual process through trial and error, and if it's manual, is there any desire to make it a bit automated? And by saying automated, I wonder whether there is any rule for machine learning and artificial intelligence to, yeah, to assist the designer by removing some of the, by eliminating some of those manual tasks. Um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, it becomes particularly significant when you think about manufacture. Um, and we learn a lot from the electronics industry and, and uh, you know, I don't think the uh, AI was, was strong then. So they, they tend to use sort of Monte Carlo approaches and things like that. Um, so it was, you know, really trial and error, but, you know, sort of um, highly optimized trial and error. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, basically, the, the thing is, if you if you try and make a whole wafer full of chips and, and it, you know, there can be thousands and thousands of, of, there can be hundreds of active devices on each chip and there can be hundreds and thousands of chips on every wafer and then there can be hundreds of wafers going through, um, you know, every hour. So you really need to be sure that your designs are going to be robust uh, against all the fabrication errors. So you, you need to optimise any, any sort of, performance optimizations you need to do in the context of manufacturability optimizations as well. And that's very, very complicated. So, so what that means is like, I mentioned that design framework, the ITKIS design framework, that sort of modularizes things and makes it very abstract. And so it's easy for many, many people to work simultaneously on multiple different parts, but it also means it's actually easy for machines to interface with those things as well. So um, again, you know, send me an email. Um, I'd be very happy to sort of, um, uh, either talk to you directly about it or put you in contact with some people who I know are working on those sorts of areas. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is almost bringing us to an end uh, of the session. And uh, Anne, once again, thank you very much for your superb presentation. We are very proud having you and your uh, research center and RMIT making so much contribution, uh, both in Victoria Australia and internationally. Uh, we, we really appreciate all of your contributions and many thanks for your presentation as part of ITP SMC uh, Victorian chapter lecture series. Really oh, thank, you. thank you so much, Said, and I, I look forward to catching up with you in person at some point in the not too distant future. Absolutely, we look forward. To that. I'd love to come and visit you in Deakin. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All thank right. You. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to uh, an end for this session. And we look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you. And have a great day, everyone.